please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. On the show today, Shumi test rides the BMW G310R, another BMW motorcycle made in India. All the mucky action from this year's Isuzu Rainforest Challenge in Goa. And Rohit tells you which compact luxury SUV you should be spending your money on. Hi, welcome to Overdrive. You're watching the show with me, Sohini Dath. Now, the BMW G310R has been a long time coming. It's been five years since BMW and TVS joined hands together to work on small displacement platforms. Now, there are three motorcycles that have come in India based on this platform. TVS first rolled out the Apache RR310 and BMW has been uh, producing the BMW G310R and the G310GS in India, but it hasn't been sold in India up until now. Shumi has got a first ride of this motorcycle. It's his first impression. Take a look. The adventure tour is very cool in India right now, and I thought that's why the 310 GS is gathering all the attention. Well, I've just ridden this for a short while, and I can tell you this is a special motorcycle. Now, the history of this motorcycle is pretty clear. The styling is inspired by the S1000R and in that sense it's supposed to be a sporty, naked, comfortable street, little bit of highway kind of motorcycle. Uh, there's not a lot of body work on this and it does make difference to the performance in the sense it's about 10 kilos lighter than the GS. Uh, makes the same power though, 34 PS and 28 Nm. But despite making the same power, the 10 kilos add up and this feels like a much more urgent, much stronger motorcycle as uh, engines go. The frame again is the same but we've got uh, smaller suspension, less travel uh, and a little bit less rake and trail and that makes the motorcycle feel more connected to you, get more feedback. The rear shock unit is again also smaller uh, and in that sense it's a lower slung, low seat height, easy to get on with motorcycle. But what I'm surprised about is its turn of speed because it is a BMW in the sense that it's not frantic or urgent or wants to do everything right now but this motorcycle does egg you on a little bit in a very gentle way where it's sort of saying um, we can go faster, why didn't you try that? And when you go faster, it says, uh, we can go a little bit faster than that, why didn't you try that? So honestly, I haven't had a chance to cruise on this uh, at a steady pace for a while, but cutting through light traffic uh, on an empty road we are on the outskirts of Gurgaon today, this is just brilliant. It always seems to have enough torque, and in that, it also seems to have just a little bit more vibration than the GS. It's not a deal breaker, but if you go for a test ride, just see how you feel about it. I think you'll be okay with it, but there is just a little bit more than the GS on this. The other part of this motorcycle is its handling because it's a smaller, lower, uh, more compact motorcycle. Turning it into corners is beautiful. It's natural, it's planted, it's sticky and it's so confident. And part of that, of course, is 17-inch tires, Michelin Pilot Sport tires, they're sticky tires. We know these tires from the RR310, the TVS motorcycle, uh, based on the same platform as this. Based on that, it handles really well. I really enjoy riding it. It's a natural motorcycle on that front too. Ride quality though is a little bit stiffer than the GS. Uh, part of it is the configuration. The, the GS does have a longer shock. But despite that, I would not call it uncomfortable. It's just a little bit sportier than I thought it would be when I saw it. But the highlight of this motorcycle for me are these brakes. They are just stunning. They are exactly how I think brakes should be. There's a lot of bite. They're very progressive. There's lots of feel and you can modulate heavily. In fact, I think I pulled my first ever rolling stoppy completely without intending to today during my tracking shots. It's a time we're trying to ride steadily, so a stoppy just doesn't occur to you as a normal thing to happen in that circumstance. But it did. It's, it's brilliant. I really, really enjoyed riding it. So, if you're in the market for a motorcycle that needs to go through the city, take you down the highway a little bit, I know that it is easy to say that the 310R is an expensive motorcycle, but just look at it. Like BMW keeps telling us, they only make one specification for India, uh, and this specification goes everywhere. There's a Euro spec and a US spec, they're the same motorcycle, they've altered slightly. Within those are families that go to each market. This is one of the Indian motorcycles, so basically that means you get a front number plate, a sari guard, etc. It's exactly what the Europeans buying, and the quality levels on this motorcycle are stunning. Every panel fits exactly as it should, every fastener, everything looks like somebody thought about what should go on the motorcycle to match what say the R1200 GS or the S1000R is in terms of your quality perception. So for that money, this kind of quality, that kind of performance, I think BMW has done a kind of a good job on this thing. The service cost is also not unreasonable. I was told three to four thousand rupees for a service, ten thousand kilometer intervals after the first service. So in that sense, I think BMW thought this through. 
The EMIs, it starts at uh, 6,999, which is a good price, includes the RSA in that. Warranty is three years standard. So BMW has actually thought this process through and this is a well-packaged motorcycle. If you're in the market for something like this, do go to a BMW showroom near you, take a test ride and see. I think you will be as surprised as I was because the GS is fun and it's a very competent motorcycle. It's enjoyable to ride and I think it make a great highway bike, but this thing is just alive. It's awesome. Well, in case you missed our review of the other G310 GS motorcycle, the adventure tourer from BMW Motorrad India on the show last week, you can head to our YouTube channel and find out what Shumi has to say about that particular motorcycle. It's time for us to take our first break here on the show. But on the other side, we will get to all the mucky action from this year's Isuzu Rainforest Challenge. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. Now, it's a week-long mucky affair, one that marks the fifth edition of the Isuzu Rainforest Challenge in India. Now, the event here has just grown by leaps and bounds and there are 38 teams all here to battle some of the toughest challenges in Goa. What's in it for the winners? RFC India is part of the Rainforest Challenge of Malaysia and the top finisher gets to take home $10,000 and also a chance to compete in the final round of the global RFC held in Malaysia, which is worth $3,900. The competitors in India are driving 4x4 machines that are powered by 1.6-litre engines with a choice of petrol or diesel powertrains going up to above 3-litre configurations. To navigate through the unforgiving terrain, the cars are allowed some essential modifications to strengthen the chassis and fit non-standard engines and suspension systems. The popularity of RFC in India has seen many firsts from various parts of the country, including three teams coming in from Northeast India for the first time and an all-women's team from Bangalore roughing it out as well. We won't deny that it's, uh, it's tough. You have to have a lot of patience, you have to have a lot of endurance. It's a, it's a balance of physical and mental strength. Um, we uh, felt that sometimes um, even pulling a stuck, stuck winch rope was, was so uh, difficult, getting up a few obstacles where you have to be uh, having a clear mind and be daring to just jump into it. You have to just switch off and just do what you have to do. I mean, getting into that rhythm was difficult. We saw fair warnings all over the place. RFC is not for the faint-hearted. And with just a glance at a couple of stages, we understood why. The stage is all like natural terrain. We don't use machinery to make anything. It's just all natural. So I'm just picking for something demanding, but not... Uh, it, it's always dangerous out there, but the rules cover that, the safety features in the cars protect the driver and co-driver so but we just have to make it demanding and um, every other year up to this year we've had bunted courses and it was um, like walking around in front of the car telling them to come this way but this year due to the experience I've been able to play some mind games so not as much bunting I've left obstacles open so I only want to go here but I've given them a lot of options how to get to that point and it's been fun. Driving through every stage within 15 minutes with as few penalties as possible can be nerve-wracking. But with the right driver-co-driver pairing and lots of trust, this team sport makes for an interesting challenge even for spectators. Uh, no doubt every year the level goes higher and this time stages were very tough and uh, I had a little bad luck. First day, second day and third day I opened the stages and that was the toughest stages I opened. So a lot of DRFs, so that's why. We live in 3, 2, 1, go! The format for all 26 stages was simple. Each team was given 15 minutes to navigate through a stage and were awarded points on successfully completing the stage and not picking up penalties in case of failure to finish, non-adherence to the rules or environmental damage. 
This year's RFC for most of the stages was a fight between the defending champions Gurmeet Virdi and Kirpal Singh Tung of Gerari Offroaders, who were hoping to make this their hat trick win at RFC India, and the V5 Offroaders, piloted by nine time Indian National Rally Riders champion in two wheelers, Jagat Nanjappa and co driver Chetan Chengappa. Following close to the top finishers was GOF Emmons, Melvin Lim, and Alex Tan. The team from Cordo was an absolute delight to watch the perfect balance between the driver and co driver, which made them a tough competitor to beat. This year, basically, a slightly underprepared Jeep, but then, you know, it was our confidence that brought us in here. And then uh, the first thing that we said is let's be careful, let's not break anything on the Jeep, and yet perform well. And luckily, things have been going our way. We're fighting against a guy who's won this event three times. Yeah, then we have the Malaysian champion here. And the rest of the guys have also caught up with, you know, the top. They're all very good. Their vehicles are prepared, like, to world standards. So we would say, like, at least 50% of the guys are very strong fighters. So we need to keep it up. As far as uh, compared to other editions of RFC is concerned, uh, I certainly feel that RFC India is among the top two RFCs in the world. The, in terms of duration, firstly, the mother event runs 25 to 26 special stages over a week and that's exactly what we do. Most RFCs in other countries around the world are shorter duration RFCs which run for a weekend, two, the, two days, three days. In terms of competitors as well, 38 teams competing is perhaps one of the largest uh, uh, set of competitors in any RFCs around the world. In terms of level of difficulty, I don't think that we are in any way less than any of the other events happening uh, in the world and that you can confirm from competitors like Mervyn who have competed in other parts uh, of the world. After a week of intense competition amongst the participants, it was time to applaud the winners of this year's RFC India. In their respective categories, the men who ranked on top held the least number of penalty points and DNFs. The overall second runner-up was Gurmeet Virdi and Kirpal Singh Tung of Gerari Offroaders. And first runner-up was Melvin Lim and Alex Tan of GOA Fairmont, who finished with 1849 points out of 1800. And enjoying the top place position with 2006 points out of 2600 was Jagat Nanjappa and Chetan Chengappa of V5 Offroaders. They will now represent the country at RFC Global Series Grand Finale in Malaysia. Watching Overdrive. Now, if you're in the market looking to buy a compact luxury SUV, then you have plenty of options to choose from. So, we're going to make life a little simpler for you by getting two SUVs in a head to head comparison test. We have the all new Volvo XC40 pitted against its closest rival, the BMW X1. Rohit will get you the details. The BMW X1, which came out last year, is now in its second generation. And when we compared it to the GLA and the Q3, it was victorious and that is thanks to its more spacious cabin, its better kit that also reflects in its sales figures because it is clearly leading the charts by a big margin. But will it continue to do so? Will it continue to lead? Because now it has a very serious contender, the Volvo XC40. Volvo has started to become more of an SUV brand now and this is clearly a good time to earn that reputation. The XC40 is the third SUV offering, but it sits on a new, low-cost, modular platform called the Compact Modular Architecture or CMA, which it shares with its Chinese parent, Geely. Its design highlights are the Thor's hammer lights, the dual-tone colour scheme, an upright stance and their radical designs for its wheels. The XC40 is Volvo's smallest offering, but it is larger certainly than the GLA and also the Q3 and comparable in size to the new X1. The BMW X1 is marginally longer. While the boxier form of the XC40 gives it stronger credentials for SUV styling, the X1's sculpted lines and sleek form make the BMW appear more athletic. The M Sport trim seen here dials up the oom factor further with its sportier bodywork and lowered stance that comes courtesy of the M suspension. The cabins could make it easier though, for inside is where the difference is quite stark. 
The X1's cabin is typical BMW in its fit and finish, in its design, it's got a driver-centric profile for the dashboard, it's quite a slim profile. What's not typical BMW is the gear shifter and that's down to the platform sharing that this car has with the Mini. But all the controls fall easily at hand, they're ergonomic. The infotainment, the UI is easy to use, but this infotainment is a little laggy as compared to the other infotainment systems that you'll see in different BMW cars in the showroom. It does support BMW's native apps. It also has support for Apple CarPlay, but if you belong to any other ecosystem, sorry, no Android love for you in here. Uh, this car also gets a heads-up display, which reminds you that BMWs are the ones that are more driver-focused. And to that effect, you also get adjustable bolstering on the front seats. Unfortunately though, you cannot set the lumbar support. Speaking of the boot though, the Volvo XC40's boot offers more versatility with its quirky permutations and combinations. But if it is outright cargo space that you need, the X1 leads the class. The XC40's trump card is the aesthetics department. The XC40's cabin has a sense of occasion to it. The bright magma coloured four wool carpeting or the different textures that have been used in the cabin, it's all so nice. The quality of materials used, it's on par with what you have in the BMW X1. And the infotainment, the user interface is very easy to use, very easy to learn. But if I were to use it, I would rather prefer the infotainment that you get in the X1 primarily because it has a rotary dial, which means that I don't have to take my eyes off the road when I'm operating it. And to that effect, the infotainment screen sits quite high up on the dashboard. But if you're an audiophile, you simply can't ignore the superior audio quality that the cabin of the XC40 offers. If you're a driving enthusiast, chances are that you will first look at the BMW X1 when you're making your buying decision in this category. And you will also notice that the lower end trims come with the S-Drive suffix, which points towards the front-wheel driven architecture of the car. Now, when you start pushing that car around the bends, you do get that understeery nature. So if you want better driving dynamics, what you want is the X Sport trim, because this is the only one in the lineup that currently gets the X-Drive all-wheel drive system. And the beauty of that all-wheel drive system is that it provides or feeds most of the power to the rear wheels. And it's only when it detects slip that power is given to the front wheels. Feeding 190 PS of power and 400 Newton meters of torque to this drivetrain is BMW's humble 2-litre four-cylinder diesel engine that has a lovely mid-range pull and a linear acceleration that doesn't overwhelm the driver. I really like this 2-litre engine that powers most of the cars in BMW's lineup. In the X1, however, because it's transversely mounted, it gets the ice and 8 speed gearbox, whereas the longitudinally mounted variants get the ZF transmission. Now, when you're driving this car in the city or cruising out on the highway, this gearbox feels quite telepathic. But it's only when you start pushing the car hard around bends and around the twisties, when you really want that driving fun, that is where the difference between this gearbox and the telepathic nature of the ZF gets highlighted. Otherwise, it just feels as nice to drive. Now, the M Sport trim also comes with larger wheels and a slightly stiffer suspension setup. And this is where things get tricky. That stiffer setup also means that when you're driving on pothole roads like I'm driving right now, the ride can get quite bone jarring. There are a lot of thuds creeping into the cabin, everything starts creaking around. But when you get smooth roads, the car feels nice and planted. When you get nice corners, the car feels flat through all of it. So that's a lot of driving fun. So the gamble here is, if you want a softer ride, if you want a more plush ride, have to settle for the lower trims because that is what is going to give you the softer setup. But that also means yes, drive trims which are not as much fun to drive. So you can either have the comfort or you can have the driving fun. Not that difficult for me to choose really. I'll go with the M Sport. But quite frankly, that choice isn't that easy, especially when you drive the Volvo XC40 right after the BMW X1. It's surprising how good this car is to drive and how close it comes to the BMW in terms of driving fun and handling dynamics. I mean, we drove the X3 recently, which is a benchmark in itself for handling in that particular segment. We compared it to the XC60 and the XC60 felt so heavy through the corners. There was so much understeer when you start pushing it hard. This car doesn't feel like that at all. The stark difference that you had between the X3 and the XC60. Volvos aren't even close to being driver's cars, but the XC40 breaks that stereotype. 
it certainly isn't a benchmark, but it is a fun to drive car for the kind of segment that it caters to. Like the Bima, Volvo's 2 litre engine too is quite humble, but impresses in the city, on the highway, and even around the twisties. So the same family of the gearbox that does duty in the X1 does duty in the XC40 as well. So the characteristics more or less remain the same, and the best way to enjoy it is with the paddle shifters. Where the XC40 truly impresses is in the way it balances a supple ride quality with a flat ride through corners. Indian roads aren't a big worry for this car as long as you do not opt for the low profile tyres. And the suspension handles corners pretty well too. As compared to the X1 X Drive, there is a hint of understeer when you push the XC40 hard. So it's safe to say that the handled X AWD on the XC40 isn't as fun biased as the X1's X Drive. But it is certainly on par in terms of safety and overall grip. And this fine balance of ride and dynamics is what helps the XC40 score more points in my books. And when you speak of points, the choice between these two cars becomes much simpler. The BMW X1 is excellent as always and leaves very little room for complaint. But the XC40 just does most of the things a little bit better and finally amasses more points than the X1 to become a clear winner of this test. As you know, the automotive space is extremely dynamic and there's a lot of buzz surrounding the latest cars and motorcycles coming in the market. So you need to look no further. You just subscribe to our latest videos on our YouTube channel and you follow the website, our Facebook page as well as Twitter and all our posts on Instagram to keep yourself abreast with everything that's happening in the world of auto. We'll see you next week. Until then, goodbye and many thanks for watching.